my focus has an emphasis on the important global questions of leadership and constitutionalism. The problem that we have today in the world community is that we do have a constitution, the UN Charter, but it's a weak constitution, and as such, its role on the question of global governance is weak. The critical question for leadership is how to improve and strengthen the constitutional and juridical foundations of the UN Charter. This is no simple matter because the question of governance um, has been uh, preempted to a large extent by the development of the sovereignty idea. And the most fundamental problem of the sovereignty idea is the implicit claim to sovereign absolutism. In other words, even in domestic sovereign states, the governing class is generally um, uneasy about the business of limiting its own capacity to govern via a written constitution. So even though we have many constitutions, those constitutions tend to be paper forms of law rather than in reality, real checks on governance. But this problem becomes even more problematic when we look at the question of global governance and a multitude of sovereigns, many of whom do not really wish to be restrained by any form of constitutionalism, whether it be domestic or international. That forces us to take a harder look at the problem of managing governance itself. And this has not been a, a, an easy problem. Historically, we've tried to uh, uh, moderate the management of power by separating it between executive, judicial, and legislative branches of government. Uh, but these were not adequate. And uh, uh, the, the, the problem of sovereign absolutism uh, remained a historical problem for quite some time. Uh, probably the best illustration of the effort to limit sovereign absolutism uh, was the uh, Magna Carta. In the Magna Carta, uh, the uh, significant uh, elites, the nobility, essentially drafted a written uh, uh, statement of principles which were to limit what the sovereign could do. The sovereign, of course, was not happy with the Magna Carta, but the rest of the population was. Uh, in any event, the Magna Carta provides us with that rather excellent illustration of the importance of a, a written instrument to manage governance. Now, when we come to the problem of governance at the global level, uh, two of the most important uh, illustrations of, uh, of um, the use of a written instrument was the adoption of the American Constitution, uh, although that in itself had many constraining features and in ultimate fact it was almost uh, superseded by a civil war. And from the example of the American Constitution, we got the French Bill of Rights. Uh, so these uh, written instruments became really important models for constraining uh, unlimited governance. The problem that we have in the Second World War, First World War, was that we had um, sovereigns unconstrained by any international limitations no such thing as a global constitution. And the consequence was we had the worst civil war, uh, the worst world war in human history. Uh, the American president, Woodrow Wilson, emerged with the idea of a form of global constitutionalism. This was uh, put into something called the League of Nations. But the American uh, politicians were not happy about limiting U.S. sovereignty via 
the Charter of the League of Nations. On the other hand, the other states found a loophole in the Charter, uh, the so-called unanimity rule, which meant that any single sovereign could stop the League of Nations in its tracks and prevent it from doing anything by simply not agreeing to a decision of the League. The consequence was that the totalitarian powers gained prominence and this led essentially to the worst world war in human history, the Second World War. The lesson garnered from the Second World War emerged even before the United States uh, entered the war in the form of an agreement between Churchill and Stalin, and that was the Atlantic Charter. The Atlantic Charter has, uh, in principle, adopted four freedoms. Freedom of speech and expression, freedom of, from want and freedom from fear and, uh, and uh, freedom of conscience and belief. Uh, in any event, the, the, uh, uh, the Atlantic Charter became the uh, written statement of the war aims of the Allies and essentially formed the basis, the conceptual and normative basis for the creation of a United Nations a United Nations Charter, and an International Bill of Rights. And that become important because um, uh, the, the UN has some problems. One of those problems is the Security Council. One permanent member can veto action by the Security Council, essentially making the UN impotent. We need some form of reform of the Security Council. Possibly that could be to enlarge the permanent members of the Security Council and require at least two or three members before veto can be accepted. Uh, another change that could be considered by the UN is that uh, states nominate essentially bureaucrats uh, to fill in positions of the UN or representatives. What they could do is elect half of those representatives popularly, this would increase the discourse amongst we the people of the UN itself, and it would provide some flexibility in the UN leadership as it operates at the practical level. <clears throat> now, additional, in addition to this, there's some understandings that, at least at the intellectual level, oh, we can make. Uh, one is simply a better understanding of the social process and power background of the global system. If you want global governance, you better understand that process. And part of that process is tied is tied to the um, uh, to the way in which human beings organize themselves. Values play a role in this. Institutions play a role in this. And these institutions can be identified. The values can be identified, but we need to be very explicit about what the values are and how, what institutions are specialized uh, to secure them, because these are the institutions that we should work from through the UN system itself uh, to modify or strengthen them and to improve the human condition. The paper outlines the main values and institutions that we have identified through science, and it then outlines the importance of the global constitutional system itself, namely the UN Charter, and its keynote precepts, which are crucial. If you want to understand the global constitutional system, you have to understand the fundamental precepts behind it. And then what strengthens the global constitutional system is the adoption of the Global Bill of Rights. And the Global Bill of Rights has a numerous values, and those values are essential to the survival of humanity. So we need leadership uh, to make sure that the International Bill of Rights, the precepts behind the, the, uh, the, the UN Charter uh, are taken seriously uh, by, by uh, leaders that are uh, committed uh, to achieving those fundamental principles of global order. Again, global governance really can be divided into two levels. One is at the very minimum, 
the constitution must secure a system of minimum global order, you know, peace, security, and so forth. Uh, but then, uh, because human beings are purposive and values are themselves dynamic, we need to find a way uh, to approach the problem of the uh, of a world order in the optimal sense. So we don't we not only must we have minimum order, we must have some scope for optimal order, an optimal order that in Proves the condition of humanity. Uh, with those in with those issues in mind, I have then outlined some of the major problems that we confront, including legal uh, the problem of climate change, and uh, so these issues: climate change, pandemics, war, nuclear weapons, and so forth, are essential to the principles of global governance if humanity is to survive. Thank you.